Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, you know, I usually, <laughs> it's quite rare that I sort of go speechless, but uh, I was, of course, expecting Carl to sing a solo, but, you know, this time around we might be spared. I, I, I'm reminded a little bit about the sort of former prime minister stuff. Um, I remember, must have been about 2018, I was at the European Investment Bank at the time, and were able to join a uh, summit meeting in Brussels, and of course there you have all of your old prime minister colleagues, etc., etc., and Theresa May was there as well, and I met her for the first time. She was in a spot of trouble at the time, and there was talk about resignation and change. I didn't think about it. So, of course, you know, I cracked the normal thing, and, hey, guys, you know what the best working title in the world is? Everyone's looking at me. Former prime minister. <laughs> and sort of everyone else laughed except Theresa May. It was <laughs> There was another rather fun event there as well. Uh, <clears throat> one of our favorites, uh, Victor Orban, was there. And I said, Victor, how are you? Oh, probably better than I deserve. <laughs> so at least, you know, he has a sense of humor uh, as well. It, it's really nice to be here today. And, and thank you, Gunvor, for the invitation. And also, thank you for having been the super board member of Marti Ahtisaari's Peace Foundation, CMI, for so many years. Uh, we miss you. I'll kick off today with uh, a little bit of an intro, and then I promise I will only once make three points. Uh, and the three points will be the first one on, on Finland and Sweden, the second one on Europe, and the third uh, on the new global order. So we decided to change the tack a little bit today instead of talking about uh, Nordic welfare or Gini coefficients. Um, or the combination of uh, liberal democracy, social market economy, capitalism and socialism, will probably focus more on the security situation as things go. And because this is a future forum, I always begin by saying that I think we human beings have a tendency to over-rationalize the past. So we draw examples from the past and think that something happened in a way that we have judged it a hundred years later. Secondly, we have a tendency to over-dramatize the present. But I don't think we're doing that at the moment. It is, it's a huge moment in, in European and perhaps global history as well. But what we do when we over-rationalize over the past, over-dramatize the present, we quite often, much like uh, Gunvor said, we end up underestimating the future. Uh, and I think that's what we need to avoid today. Now, if I look at, by way of introduction, at the Finnish track and linking it, obviously, to Sweden and to a certain extent to Estonia as well, I, I find it, over-rationalizing the past, quite remarkable how agile we have been throughout our history. In other words, we've been able to react to big change quite quickly. Um, and by that I mean to say that in 1809, when we left the Kingdom of Sweden, uh, and joined uh, the uh, Russian Empire <laughs> as an autonomous part, uh, we maximized uh, our autonomy immediately. When uh, we gave Russia its independence in 1917, <laughs> uh, we also maximized uh, our uh, independence at the time. And it was actually quite audacious to file a declaration of independence on the 6th of December 1917, actually written by uh, the father of Finnish grammar, Emil Nestor Setala, uh, at the time. By the same token, I think we were able to survive peace in 1944. And I hope the Ukrainians will be able to survive peace. But we did that in a period which wasn't very comfortable for us from 1944 to 1989. But immediately in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we did the right thing and filed for EU membership, I think, on the 18th of March, 1993, if I recall correctly. I hope I get it approximately right. And I think in many ways we're very much in a similar type of a situation today, and, and that's what I'll try to deal with. I mean, this for Finland, and to a certain extent for Sweden as well, but more so for Finland, is the 1809, the 1917, the 1944, or the 1995 uh, moment uh, in our uh, history. So let me kick off with Finland and, to a certain extent, Sweden first. So point number one. Uh, here, uh, in a few international media 
um, interviews that I've done over the past five weeks, uh, I've always stressed that a country's security is based on two pillars. Uh, one of them is geography, uh, and the other one is history. There's not much you can really do about your geography or the fact that you know, we have 1,340 kilometers of uh, border with Russia, but there are moments in history which you can't change, but where you have to act uh, and uh, react. And that's always been, in many ways, the foundation, I think, of Finnish security political thinking. And then if you link to that really two schools of thought uh, from international relations, one being idealism or ide uh, idealist school and the other one being realist, I think we've always combined the two quite well. By idealism, I mean that we've been able to survive next to a big neighbor, uh, Sweden, no, I mean Russia. Uh, and and uh, I'm trying to get Carl to wake up here. So, uh, so and, 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 uh, and, and that's been a big part. We've, under, you know, we, we, we've thought that even though we live next to essentially an imperialist, uh, aggressive power, which is much, much bigger than we are, we still need to cooperate. And then it's always about finding that ideal balance of, of, of that cooperation. But the realist school comes in basically with our thinking about a independent and, and strong defense. It goes into our maanpuolustus korkeakoulu, uh, where we get basically uh, the societal elite of the country to come together and rally around the defense flag uh, over the years. And we also always make sure that our defense expenditure uh, is not sacrificed. Of course, sometimes it has to be. But, you know, when the Cold War ends in 1989 and the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, and Finland decides to buy over 60 F-18 fighter jets, it's not exactly to defend ourselves against Sweden, is it? Uh, so the bottom line is that there's a really strong realist school uh, in our thinking, and I think it is extremely important to understand that uh, at the moment. There are not too many countries uh, in the world, let alone Europe, who have reserves of about 900,000 men and women and who can mobilize within a matter of days or weeks 280 to 300,000 men and women into the armed uh, forces and who are so closely interlinked to the Western systems uh, of uh, military. So I think actually now we will be seeing uh, in the next few weeks and months, what I call the final step uh, in Finland's uh, integration uh, to the West and to the Western institutions. The ones that we were not able to join, obviously, from 1809 to 1917, uh, not really from 1917 to 1944, but then from a distance with various integration mechanisms uh, during the Cold War. We took the big step in 1995, by joining the European Union together with Sweden uh, and Austria. And now, to a certain extent, we will be taking the final step to uh, a defense alliance of uh, democracies where I think we will have belonged uh, for a long, long time. A lot of people ask me about the upsides and downsides and potential risks uh, of joining NATO, and especially whether we should uh, do that uh, together with uh, Sweden. My first observation is to say that no matter which decision we end up taking, joining or not joining, it will involve risks. My personal belief is that uh, Finland will join NATO and it will file an application for NATO membership. Uh, it will not be a matter of days, but I think I can fairly comfortably say that in my judgment, as again a professor, it's so much easier to do this with that title than with the prime minister or president or foreign minister title, um, I am quite confident that we will file an application uh, within weeks, if uh, not months. The key here is obviously to get Sweden along. In the beginning, I was quite worried that it would not happen, uh, but my analysis of the past few days is that it will happen. Uh, and then all of us will start looking at dates and, and you know, when we put in white papers into parliament, uh, et cetera, et cetera, when the elections in Sweden are or, or, or when NATO has a summit meeting in Madrid, 
at the end of, of, of June. Those are all very important, but I think the most important thing at this particular moment is to maximize your security guarantees in what I call a gray zone. And that gray zone is the moment when our prime minister and our president, together with the government and the parliament, decides to take a decision to file an application. That gray zone will switch on very quickly. And by that, I mean uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid attacks, cyber attacks, information wars, threats uh, coming uh, from Russia. Uh, I feel that it would be much more comfortable to do it with Sweden, but I do think that we kind of have reversed roles, and Carl and I have spoken about it quite a lot over the past few weeks, um, reversed roles in the sense that uh, in the early 1990s, Sweden took the lead in joining the European Union and filing an application, a little bit by surprise, I might add, um, uh, and, 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 and joining the European Union, and we, us filing a little bit later. This time there will be no surprises. There will be absolutely no surprises. But what I have also told my Swedish friends is that we will take the decision of filing an application uh, independent of the Swedish decision. So we will go in uh, no matter what happens. I just hope that we do it together. And here I also add that I am eternally grateful to the Baltic states, not least Estonia, Sitavi Roivas here, uh, for joining NATO in the early 2000s, because that increased the security of the Baltic Sea region uh, exponentially. And you can just imagine the situation that we would all be in right now if uh, the Baltic states were not uh, members of NATO, uh, and if and when Putin uh, would be continuing his expansionary politics. So I do think uh, that a Finnish NATO application uh, is imminent. And for all of those who are questioning um, the use of words by our political leadership, you can always do that in a democracy, which is great. But be aware that this type of a situation for political leadership in any country, but especially in Finland and Sweden, is extremely difficult. And it is absolutely clear uh, that if any one of them would say that we will file an application for NATO, that is when the grey zone begins. So please allow them to have a little bit of oxygen uh, in this debate, allow them to do their job, which I think, if I may add, they are doing brilliantly, whether it's visiting Washington, whether it's visiting Ankara, whether it's visiting Brussels, uh, or whether it's uh, visiting London and having multiple conversations. So I at least... Uh, as someone coming from a family where 75% of the family are in NATO, even though I'm the outsider so far, I feel quite comfortable. Second point, Europe. And I'll be a little bit shorter on, on, on these. Um, I think Europe has acted with uh, unforeseen uh, speed and unity. I'm a bit of an EU nerd, been doing this stuff since 1989 as a civil servant, academic uh, politician, or I guess banker as well. And there's always this feeling that the European Union is not united. But I've never seen uh, the stealth, uh, the, the sort of determination that we've seen with the European Union. The example that I give is that during the Euro crisis, it took us somewhere between two to four years to set up the European stability mechanism. During, during COVID, it took us somewhere between two to four months to set up the biggest rescue package in the form of next generation Europe. In this war, it took us two to four years, two to four uh, uh, days, basically, to reverse the common foreign security and defense policy that the European had, Union had had. So I always felt that, you know, the European Union was a regulatory superpower. But in the past, I'd say, 12 years, 13 years, it, had also, it has also become an actor, whether it's in the field of finance and monetary policy or economics, whether it's in the field of health, or now also uh, in foreign and security policy. Uh, I do, however, warn, no matter how EU nerdy uh, I am, that this will not last. Because what will happen next is that we start moving towards the phase of, of reconstruction. So right now, all of our solidarity is with uh, the Ukrainian people and, and President Zelensky. But there will be a moment when this is reversed. And that moment basically is when we start getting a little bit tired uh, of the war and we start looking at our own, own well-being. So that basically means that we realize 
that inflation is real. We realize that food prices are going to be higher, energy prices are going to be higher. We see that at the gas pump, uh, and we see it with our electricity and heating bills at home. Uh, and also the moment when we realize that so far we have only 3.5 million uh, refugees uh, in Europe. So there will become a moment when we start feeling very uncomfortable with the situation, not only uh, in the war, but with ourselves. It's a completely natural reaction. And that's why I think it's extremely important that European leaders today already start communicating the realities and the price of peace and the price of war. The price of peace and the price of war will be uh, a decline in our living standards. And we have to understand that. That is the price that we are paying for Putin's aggression. And the sooner we begin this communication, the better. Because otherwise we will get into a similar vicious circle that we had after the financial crisis with right-wing and, may I add, left-wing populists uh, emerging left, right and center around uh, in Europe. The example that I give is it's much easier for Emmanuel Macron to win the French presidential elections uh, in the next week or so than it will be for leaders to win elections in Europe or in the United States in, say, six months, let alone two years. So Macron goes into the elections with the war, Biden or whoever goes into the elections with inflation uh, and energy prices, and the situation is going to be very different. On Europe, final point, I think we're looking at a fairly permanent split of Europe into two. On one hand, you have Russia wherever the borders are defined, which is authoritarian, which is totalitarian, and which is aggressive. And on the other hand, you have the rest of Europe with roughly 30 to 35 countries with varying memberships in the EU and NATO, but all of them embracing in one form or another liberal democracy, social market economy, and globalization. And this split will be permanent for as long as Putin and the current regime or uh, a follow-up prince uh, will be uh, in power. For a country like Finland, this is bad news. The reason is very simple. I come back. History and geography. The last thing you want is the biggest North Korea in the world right at your border. It's a very uncomfortable thing, and that's why I hope that solutions will be found in the long run. Final and third point, the world. One of the things that we have to understand, especially here in Finland, in the Nordics, and in Europe, this conflict is not only about Russia versus the West. This is much, much broader than that. It is absolutely understandable that we look at it from a Russia versus the West or Russia versus the EU and the US type of a, a situation. But the truth is that the rest of the world is looking at this differently. There was a lot of schadenfreude against uh, Russia when we saw the vote in the UN uh, a couple of weeks back. 141 countries condemned Russia, 35 abstained, and four rather pariah states, uh, Syria, North Korea, uh, Belarus, and Eritrea voted for Russia. And we thought, great, the rest of the world is with us. But a few people noticed that actually the 35 abstaining countries represented not only big countries like China, India, South Africa, but it represented roughly, roughly half of the world's population. And the reaction of that, we have to understand that it means a lot. It means that once we start building a new world order, it will have to reflect the world in 2022, not the world in 1944 or, say, the world in 1989. The mistake we did in 1989 was to think that we would be witnessing the end of history and the transition of all 200 nation states in the world towards some kind of a liberal democracy, market economy, and globalization. But the truth is that a lot of the countries that were, yes, freed from the shackles of communism, but also had been freed from the shackles of colonialization, didn't feel as confident, didn't feel as good as we might have felt about the system. And therefore, I think, and I predict, working on a book on this, so hopefully it turns out, that we will be basically looking uh, at a following type of a system. 
we're not going to go into deglobalization, but we will go into the regionalization of globalization. And the reason for this is pretty much economics, Ricardo, and business. Because if you look at the value chains and how they had been created uh, in a globalized world where we thought that trade brings with it eternal peace and happiness, uh, they have been disrupted three times. One, with Donald Trump in 2016 and America first. Two, with COVID. And three, with the war in Ukraine. This basically means that we have to start thinking more and more regionally about business, uh, not necessarily only the flow of goods or services, but more about manufacturing and value chains uh, in general. Now, the the sort of outcome of this, I would predict, and this is just an academic prediction, would go as follows. We will be creating a few different blocks. One block uh, will be a block which I call the liberal world order, the one that we thought that everyone would uh, embrace post-1989. The liberal world order is obviously about uh, globalization, it's about free trade, and it's about freedom and democracy. Uh, and, you know, it'll have with it the European Union, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you know, South Korea, Japan, uh, and the rest. But do not think for one moment that this liberal order will dominate the world. It will be only one block among others. The second block will be an authoritarian block. It's a slightly uncomfortable one. It's not an alliance. Uh, and that one holds China, perhaps Russia, a few others. And then there will be a block, a third and final point, of the rest. I don't know who is going to come in there. India, perhaps a, a few others. But the bottom line is that we're looking at a fragmentation of the world, of an era of unpeace, where basically everything can be weaponized from information to technology, to energy. So the things that we thought would bring us together will actually split up. And the most important thing is to get a lot of the countries that felt hard done by post-1944 and 1989 to feel that they're part of the system. So therefore, I conclude by saying that, number one, I predict that Finland and Sweden will join NATO this year. Number two, uh, I predict that the new security system in Europe will be permanent until and split into two until Putin leaves. I'm not putting in in Biden's terms, I guess. Uh, and then number three, we have to start thinking about the future and the future of a new world order, which will be very different from what it used to be. That's why 2022 is pretty close to 1917, 1944 and 1989. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Um, so in this uh, new world order, uh, what will Nordic cooperation look like? And, and also, if you can elaborate, because you mentioned your contacts with your friends in Sweden and sort of how, how is uh, Sweden and Finland collaborating right now, formally and informally, uh, since February 24. Yeah, was this an off-the-record event? Um, <laughs> I don't believe so, so because no. I've seen some journalists, no, no, but I'm, just, I'm sure they, are, just they are friendly. You know, so. I'm looking at Caius here. <laughs> yeah, be aware. No, uh, I mean, two answers to your questions. The first one is how will the Nordics cooperate? I think they'll become closer than we have seen uh, since we joined the European Union. Of course, in the European Union, we had a few sort of variable decisions, and with NATO as well, um, in the sense that, you know, we joined the Euro, the rest of the Nordics didn't. Sweden and Finland did not join NATO. The rest of them were in there. Norway and Iceland didn't join the European Union. Uh, and Denmark uh, had an opt-out on defense and, and on the Euro. So the glue inside the European Union wasn't that strong. But now I think we will see a completely sort of next level of cooperation. Second answer, how have we done it, uh, Carl? I'm, I'm speaking here under your authority. Um, uh, I think there has been a, a really wonderful conversation that, that we've had both with current political leadership and former political mm -hmm. leadership, really across the board. And that just shows the sort of 
kindred and the, the, the sort of family sense that we have, it, it's completely across party lines, right? So, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of current and former po politicians in Sweden, uh, and, and obviously Carl has done the same thing, and then we talk with each other quite a lot and a few others. So, it's, you know, it's, it's, we know exactly what the other one is doing and, and, and what the movements are. It's gone so far that I think I'm tomorrow in Stockholm will scramble in for Ukraine, uh, sort of this charity event. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's been good. It's been good. You mentioned uh, the risks of joining and the risks of not joining, and like all choices here come at a price. Uh, you elaborated a little bit on sort of the risks by joining, and you were quite, uh, if I may, optimistic about both Finland and Sweden joining. But let's say that uh, Finland uh, joins alone. Uh, what will that scenario look like from a Nordic perspective? Uh, in spite of Sweden looking ridiculous, my opinion. <laughs> I, 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 would never, I would never say that. Um, I, I think the worst scenario would be that Sweden joins and Finland doesn't. Right? Okay, fair uh, enough. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's start with the, with the sort of bad news. Mm -hmm. Now, if then the second option would be that we join and Sweden doesn't, uh, you know, there will be a shield of protection, which uh, is on the next level, obviously mm -hmm. because of our defense cooperation, uh, because of Swedish membership in the European Union, and because Sweden is, by definition, not a neutral country uh, anymore. Uh, but I do think that eventually Sweden will join as well. Uh, and, you know, had you asked me this question last week, I would have said Finland will go uh, and Sweden will come a little bit later. But I actually think that we've joined the same peloton uh, in the cycling race at the moment. And mm -hmm. you guys are drafting us quite well and we'll join in together. That's my, you know, mm -hmm. academic guess. You started out by, by saying that we, have, we sort of changed the theme, which was sort of obvious, uh, because it's very hard to talk about something that is not defense and security policy right now. But, but like looking a little bit forward, uh, what will be sort of the, the issues in addition to defense and security policy for Finland, Sweden, the Nordics uh, at large uh, going forward from a global p perspective? What, what are the issues we should have top of mind? Yeah, no, I think it's a really good question, but because of course there will be a moment when the war ends, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we're very close to that. I mean, I remember brokering peace in Georgia. We did it in five days, mm -hmm. uh, but the stakes were much lower and the end game was, you know, two frozen conflicts, Abhasia and, and South Ossetia. Yeah. By the way, I think, Carl, you put it on Twitter correctly. We should be actually looking at what Russia will do there. Will there be frozen conflicts after this or will they try to move in? Mm -hmm. But in any case, um, there will be a moment when this ends. And that's when we come back to the notion you know, that I'm toying with. It, it comes from Mark Leonard, um, European Council for yeah. Foreign Relations. He wrote a book called The Age of Unpeace. Uh, and I've been toying a lot about with the idea that the, the, the line between war and peace is blurred, right? Mm. So we don't exactly know what is an act of war versus mm. a state of peace. So you can use energy uh, as a weapon. We are using sanctions and the economy mm. uh, as a weapon. Technology can be used as a weapon. Information mm. can be, and actually human beings can be used as a weapon. In other words, you know, you force migrants into, you know, as we've seen borders, Poland, uh, Lithuania and elsewhere. So I, I, I think we need to, high, and our president has said this quite well, we, we need to hike up our defenses mm. on, on hybrid and, 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 and cyber warfare. This is the sort of realist in us, right? Mm. Then I come to the idealist. I still think that Nordics are welfare superpowers. So, you know, we cannot force our way of life or our society upon others, but by way of example, we can show that, hey, listen, it's a little bit better to be a liberal democracy and a social market economy than to be an authoritarian state. And of course, the example is that if you look at the distribution of wealth uh, and the division and split, which is the biggest in the world on the border, it's the one between mm -hmm. Finland and Russia. So I've, uh, one question about uh, that is fin about Finland more specifically, and that is how you think this will play out in relation to your relations to immigrants. Uh, because uh, if we compare Sweden and Finland, for example, we have uh, made different choices. Uh, and uh, this might sort of actually link to competitiveness going forward. So. Do you believe this is the time uh, when Finland will become more open? Yeah, I think 
openness of society and especially as it is linked to immigration is quite often in history been driven by necessity. Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw that in the United States. And to a certain extent, one of the most integrated societies that we have today, paradoxically, is the United Kingdom. I mean, we fail to understand that, but when we go to London or when we go to Birmingham, where I'll be spending uh, you know, Easter, you, you really see it and you feel it. And yes, Finland and Sweden took a different approach. Your immigration in the 1970s was driven by necessity. In other words, Finns looking for work in Sweden mm -hmm. and then providing for growth and welfare in Sweden. Then, of course, the approaches that we took actually during the uh, asylum crisis, they were not that dissimilar. Of course, you're a bigger country, you have a longer tradition, you took a bigger hit. And you've always been like, you know, 20 years ahead of us in this. So I, I do foresee a little bit of a change uh, and I call it, you know, sympathy immigration and sympathy and heart changes the mind. Uh, and in that sense, of course, a lot of people are reflecting, okay, what's the difference between uh, an asylum seeker from a war zone in Afghanistan or Syria, usually a male, uh, versus uh, a woman or a child coming from Ukraine. So it'll force us to think about uh, immigration and asylum in a different kind of a way. And it is absolutely clear, all economic indicators show it, that immigration will become a necessity. And I'm actually quite glad to see the approach that perhaps the most um, uh, immigrant unfriendly party of ours, the, the true Finns or the Finns, have taken in this yeah. Ukrainian crisis. Whether it's for the right reasons or not, I, I, I don't take issue with that, but mm. it is opening up. And that has been similar with the Sweden Democrats in Sweden, by the way. So, Alexander, if you don't mind, I would like uh, to invite Carl up to the stage and share his thoughts and maybe then join the conversation with us, if that is okay with you. I've never heard Carl speak before, so this will be interesting. <laughs> 